Okay? So, um, that photo up there, we thought this was a good joke, but a photo of me from uh, what is now 29 years ago when I was president of Trinity Students' Union. And we were taken to court by the uh, beautifully named Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child, SPUC. And some of you who are of my vintage will recall the greatest chant we ever developed on the students' marches, which was SP, SPU, SPUC, SPUC off. <laughs> so we've never, we've never achieved that level of, uh, of chanting excellence since. Um, but we were taken to court by SPUC for providing information on abortion, and that's a more recent one, obviously, campaigning for a yes to repeal on the 25th of May. Um, how did we get to a position where we were taken to court as students? Well, I want to talk about, um, you know, what, about the Eighth Amendment, about the consequences, the legal consequences of the Eighth Amendment and, uh, and the tragic cases, the decades of tragic cases we've seen as a result of its enactment. So as we know, it's 35 years ago this year that the Eighth Amendment was inserted into the Constitution in 1983. I'm just too young to have voted in 83, so I am part of that generation of women and men who've grown up under the chill of the Eighth Amendment, uh, but, who have, but who never have had an opportunity to vote on, on the issue of abortion. The, the actual issue itself until now and of course we know the wording of the Eighth Amendment the state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and, and uh, with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother no coincidence that the unborn right to life was put first and of course as you'll see they're very much regarded as equal in law with all the consequences that that brings and of course at the time Mary Robinson and Peter Sutherland then Attorney General and others did warn of the dangers of inserting this text into the Constitution but even Peter Sutherland and Mary Robinson didn't quite foresee the really horrific range of cases and uh, tragedies for women that would, un that would unfold as a result. Uh, we did in 1992 add two further clauses to Article 43.3 known as the Travel and Information Clauses saying this, that the subsection shall not limit freedom to travel, the ultimate hypocrisy in other words, that we're respecting the right to life of the unborn but we absolutely accept that women and girls will travel to, uh, to have abortion in another state and of course then the Freedom of Information Clause as a result of our cases. So I want to just say a little about the cases and the legal consequences and I would depress us inutterably if I were to go through all of the cases uh, and, and I should say as a practicing barrister I was involved in some also but, uh, but I'll just give you a brief outline because over the 35 years since the uh, amendment has been in force we've seen a whole series of different cases as a result but all through those 35 years what has been consistent cons a consistent uh, reality has been the reality of women traveling so while these cases highlight particular tragedies particular incidents particular legal initiatives by anti-choice groups and more recently by individual women asserting their rights um, in the European cases we've of uh, what has been consistent has been the women traveling and of course the most recent figures in 2016 3265 women who travelled to England that year uh, and gave Irish addresses uh, in British clinics, uh, about nine or ten every day. But we know of course increasingly, as Catherine's committee heard, women are also accessing the abortion pill online here in Ireland, and we'll say a little more about that in a minute. Uh, but the first, so the first set of cases under the Eighth Amendment uh, were the abortion, were known as the abortion information cases, through which Spock used the Eighth Amendment to uh, to challenge counselling centres and well, well women and others through the courts to get them to stop giving information on abortion to women in crisis pregnancy. The reason being that if you gave, Spock argued successfully in a series of judgments, shameful judgments of the High Court and Supreme Court, Spock uh, got the courts to agree that if you give information to a woman on how she can access abortion in another country, that is in breach of the right to life of the unborn. And uh, because you're facilitating, you're effectively giving her um, the power to travel. Uh, and of course, pre-internet days, uh, in a day at a time when, again, as many of you will remember, British magazines coming into Ireland were censored to remove any ads for clinics in them. Uh, this information was not accessible anywhere else. Scrolled on the back of toilet doors, but not accessible openly from anywhere. But the, these counselling services, which were then closed down, and then students' unions, which became the last bastion. So when I was elected in '89. Uh, only a short while after the Eighth Amendment had been passed, uh, you know, my, uh, my absolutely abiding memory, which has really left an indelible mark on me, was as a young 21-year-old being rung up every day and women calling every day into the student union offices in Front Square in Trinity looking for information on abortion, looking for a phone number of a clinic in absolutely desperate circumstances from all over Ireland. And, you know, it was outrageous that four young students should be in Trinity, and indeed there were others then in UCD and elsewhere, should have been the only people to whom these women and girls could turn. And of course, you know, 
know, Spock then moved against us as they knew we would, as we knew they would. Uh, we were taken to court. We were threatened with prison. Uh, we were even chased around Front Square by guards looking to prosecute us for a crime called conspiracy to corrupt public morals, a little-known and obscure crime for which Oscar Wilde was previously prosecuted. Uh, we were, we did escape prison, not escape from prison, a very different story. <laughs> but uh, we escaped being sent to prison because a wonderful uh, barrister stepped in, Mary Robinson, uh, then a law lecturer of mine, and represented us and made law, European law arguments. But the case rattled on for about seven or eight years and we were all declared bankrupt and so on. Because, and it, the information amendment was inserted uh, finally to sort of to, to resolve it. Although there are still very strict constraints on the information doctors can give. Absolutely strict. I mean, you know, I spoke last night at a public meeting with Jerry Edwards from Termination for Medical Reasons, who spoke about even in that case where his wife, Gay, had been diagnosed with anence uh, as carrying a pregnancy that was that it, where the baby would not be born alive, uh, an anencephaly. Even in that case, where it was crucial that doctors would liaise on uh, on the treatment, the doctor treating Jerry and Gay, who who you know said, "I can do nothing for you if you unless you wish," you know, we, uh, um, uh, couldn't give written notes to, couldn't refer. Gay to the hospital in Belfast, which ultimately did terminate her pregnancy, because there is a, a ban on referral. So we have this ironic situation where, where information may be given, the phone numbers of clinics, under strict circumstances, but referral can't be done. And you may have seen in today's papers the case of Claire Malone, a young Wexford woman who, f who ha came up against that very recently, where her doc, where she couldn't, a uh, heart condition, her case was being highlighted this morning by Amnesty, a heart condition threatening her life, but not of sufficient risk to her life to allow her to have her pregnancy terminated in Ireland, and doctors in England unwilling to take a risk of terminating a pregnancy for a woman who is so ill without having referral, which couldn't be done. So she had to proceed with the pregnancy. So. You know, the X case in 1992 was, uh, uh, did I think bring home to many people, more than the information cases did, the real consequences of inserting the text into the constitution, where we had a young 14 year old girl pregnant as a result of rape, who uh, sought, whose parents sought to bring her to England for a termination, as, as you'll all be aware, the Attorney General stepped in to prevent her on the basis that <coughs> travelling would obviously undermine the life of the unborn, and the Supreme Court ultimately ruled there. Uh, in the test that is still the law, that where there's a real and substantial risk to the life as distinct from the health of the mother, which can only be avoided by termination of her pregnancy, then such termination is permissible. But it's such a high bar to overcome, as we see today with the, public, with the uh, revelation from the Claire Malone case. The risk to life must be real and substantial and only capable of being avoided by termination of pregnancy, whether the risk is that of suicide, which was an X, or physical risk, as in the Claire Malone case today. Uh, so, and yet, and yet, even when the X case had become law, many doctors, as we saw in the tragic case of Savita Halapanavar, were reluctant to terminate a pregnancy, even where there was a risk to life, for fear that the risk was not substantial enough. And the case of Savita Halapanavar, uh, the tragic case you're all well aware of, of a young woman who died in hospital in Galway, having sought a termination and been refused uh, uh, because the risk to her life was not judged sufficient until, of course, it was, and she died. Uh, you know, that case is a case in which the Eighth Amendment was engaged, and there's been some controversy from the other side about that. But anyone who has a concern about or you know, a doubt about it should look at the comments of Dr. Peter Boylan, one of the expert witnesses at the inquest, and, more per and probably more even more compellingly than that, the uh, comments of the um, the, um, the British, uh, very, uh, who, the British professor who gave evidence before Catherine's committee, Professor Arul Kumara from uh, England, who was the uh, chair of the um, uh, the coroner's expert at the Savitas at, at the inquest, and who was very uh, sorry, I think he was the chair of the inquest, and he was very clear of th that the law had played a significant role in that case. Uh, we then did pass in 2013 the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, giving uh, doctors in, uh, criteria as to how to intervene and when to intervene to save a woman's life. I should say there was a lot of controversy at the time that bill went through. Catherine and I were both in the Shannon and we both recall it vividly. Um, and there was a, uh, those who opposed it said women would lie and pretend to be suicidal and there would be a floodgate essentially of women seeking abortion if it became law. What we have seen since it became law is a very small number of women uh, uh, having pregnancies terminated here to save their lives, but only, only 25 or 26 a year, 77 in total, hardly a floodgate. 
Uh, then the tragic case of PP versus HSE, in which a young woman, a young mother of two, who had a catastrophic brain injury, uh, was, was, was dead, but was kept artificially alive in very distressing circumstances because there was a fetal heartbeat. She was in an early stage of pregnancy until the High Court ruled. Again, some comment from the other side that the Eighth Amendment was not engaged in that case. It was. It absolutely was. It was the reason why doctors went to the High Court to seek permission to turn off life support because they were concerned uh, that they could not do so while there was a fetal heartbeat. And then finally, uh, much more recently, a series of European and international law cases around, in which women have, um, have asserted successfully before the European Court of Human Rights in the ABC case and the United Nations Human Rights Committee in the Mellet and Whelan cases, they've asserted their right, you know, that the Irish state has breached their rights. In ABC it was because the law wasn't sufficiently clear about when doctors could save a woman's life and in the Mellet and Whelan cases it was because Ireland doesn't allow abortion in cases of fatal fetal abnormality. So, you know, the, those cases and a growing realisation that, that the present situation is simply untenable for women and for their doctors has meant the momentum has led, uh, we have seen a momentum and a process leading to the holding of a referendum. And you see there are pictures of Judge Mary Lefoy, Chair of the uh, Citizens' Assembly, and then a snapshot from Catherine's Committee, the Joint Committee on the Eighth Amendment. And, you know, the, both, both bodies recommended repeal of the Eighth Amendment on the basis of the expert evidence they'd heard and the testimony before them from, um, from the many people who gave evidence, including, of course, women who'd had abortions and including the Termination for Medical Reasons group. So I've just put up there very simply, and I know Catherine will go into more detail, what the recommendations of the Oireachtas Committee were, why they recommended repeal, um, because of the medical evidence they've heard around particularly when can doctors intervene to save a woman's life and we've seen that I think that's really highlighted starkly in the case that's being uh, made public today as I've said. Uh, breach of Ireland's human rights obligations which is again something that as a lawyer we're always glad to see you know that issue is significant it is significant that we are you know that over a no succession of cases now we have been found wanting in terms of international human rights obligations and then of course the practical reality and the abortion pill I know Catherine may say more about this and about the evidence you heard but that was I think a real game changer for many people on the committee the evidence that in fact abortion is happening in Ireland it's happening in as many uh, in up to two or three thousand cases every year but women are and girls are taking it under uh, very difficult conditions because they're taking it without access to med medical supervision or support ordering pills online with all the risk that entails and of course at risk of criminalization and you know the 2013 act for all the difficulty we had bringing it and it is highly restrictive and it imposes a 14-year criminal sanction on anyone who has an abortion in a circumstance where it's not necessary to save their life, including the woman herself and anyone who assists her. And for those, and again in debates on the other side, I think both Catherine and I have been asked, but there's been no prosecutions. There have been prosecutions in Northern Ireland very recently where uh, a mother and her daughter were prosecuted for importing pills online. And I think that and I think Michael McDowell said it in the Shannon, the consequence of having the Eighth Amendment in the Constitution, and certainly a consequence if it is retained after the 25th of May, is that the DPP will have to enforce the law here, and we will inevitably see prosecutions. I don't think it's scaremongering in any way to say that, you know, that that's the legal reality, that just because we've seen no prosecution so far does not mean there won't be some if the Eighth Amendment is retained. So I suppose I just want to finish by saying that... Um, the, uh, the referendum, of course, uh, will now be held on the 25th of May. Citizens will be asked to vote yes or no, to repeal in its entirety, to replace the current text with the following enabling text. Provision may be made by law for the regulation of termination of pregnancy. And of course, if that is passed, as we all, as I certainly very much hope it will be, the, um, the uh, government is committed to introducing leg legislation to regulate termination of pregnancy. The heads of bill were published. I put all this up and you're very, I'll share the slides. I have already shared the slides if anyone wants them because I think this is the sort of basic information. I've been out canvassing a lot in recent weeks and I know many of you will have. You know, this is the sort of basic information people are looking for. Well, what happens if we vote yes? Well, the this bill will be introduced or the government have committed to, be, to it being introduced. Of course, it will have to go through the Oireachtas process. Um, but what the bill provides for is to provide, as recommended by Catherine's committee, is to provide for access up to 12 weeks without specific indication as to reason. The bill actually differs from the committee recommendations in some respects. Uh, notably, it requires a 72-hour 
period between the consultation with the doctor and the uh, oh you do have the slides brilliant the consultation with the doctor and the actual carrying out of a termination uh, the uh, that's the first difference because that wasn't in the committee recommendation the second is that the committee recommendation was 12 weeks gestation that's 12 weeks fet uh, in fetal life terms however the bill provides for 12 weeks from last menstrual period which is actually much shorter it's a sh in fact a tighter time frame it's about 10 weeks I think in terms of gestational uh, uh, just of fetal gestation so uh, and there is a very valid reason there are very, very valid reasons which I know Catherine will go into that the committee made that recommendation but I would say that in terms of medical practicality that's the, the model of law we see throughout other European countries of, of uh, uh, abortion or termination being legal for up to the fir up to the end of the first trimester about 12 weeks uh, or about 10, 10 to 12 weeks fetal gestation uh, because at that it, it's in that period that clearly a procedure may be carried out medically through the abortion pill rather than surgically and it's in that period that of course there's a, it's, it's least uh, um, uh, uh, you know it's, it's 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 best if you're going to have abortion made legal that it be carried out as much as possible in the early stages of pregnancy and I should say if you look at the British uh, statistics for 2016 you'll see that 85% of women giving Irish addresses uh, access terminations within the first 12 weeks 85% so in fact that is what is currently the case even under British law so that's the uh, and of course after 12 weeks termination would only be legal in very very specific and restrictive circumstances so it's more restrictive than the British equivalent British law risk to life or serious risk to health and for or fatal fetal abnormality but only up to viability again a real myth being propagated by the other side about late-term abortion but it's been so clear it's in the legislation in the heads of bill that early delivery would be necessary there'd be no late-term abortions uh, we can talk more about that if there's uh, any questions of course and uh, I did I've also got on the slides useful information you'll see the referendum commission which is now launched fairly minimal um, information but it's there and of course it's neutral uh, there's a pro repeal my colleagues Fiona Delandres and Mairead Enright have done a great website about the eighth.com legal questions about the referendum and then of course together for yes uh, the National Civil Society Alliance, I'm on the steering group of that. Uh, it's, it's very much um, coordinating the campaign in every constituency and their website's very useful. I should say you'll also obviously be getting lots, be getting lots of literature. Uh, many of us in Labour, and I know Alison Gilliland is here, have been uh, canvassing uh, with our own literature, uh, together for yes, of canvassing with their literature. A number of us in the Oireachtas have produced on a cross-party basis a newspaper called The National Issue, which is a useful canvasser's tool to give more information. Uh, interviews with Gerry and Gay Edwards, interviews with Peter Boyle and others, and I know you have the trade union newspaper. And I suppose just to say it's, it's great to be here with, you know, in an within an organisation just to pay tribute to ICTU over the years for standing for women's rights, for opposing the amendment in 83 and for continuing to oppose it and to campaign. I'm proud to wear the ICTU badge and I'll finish by saying let's hope we see repeal on the 25th. It's about more than abortion, it's about more than women's rights. Thank you.